to The Fitterist Show with your host, Christopher Allen, where we explore the art of mind and body conditioning. This week's episode, we look at obesity in the United States and some of the staggering statistics of this epidemic across both adults and children. We also examine the financial and health impact of obesity from a reference study that ranks both U.S. states and U.S. cities relative to their obesity levels. While no state has really any acceptable level of either adult or childhood obesity, there are some geographic differences that could help us better understand this unfortunately widespread health condition. Discussion of the causes of obesity, some of the health challenges and factors associated with obesity, and maybe what we could do to both treat existing obesity as well as help, perhaps more importantly, and prevent the prevalence of obesity in the next generation of children. Let's jump in. Not surprisingly, with the national adult obesity rate hovering around 40%, let me say that again, 40% of Americans, which is about 94 million adults, obesity is a very very large problem. Obesity has become a truly a public health crisis in the United States. The medical condition, which involves having an excessive amount of body fat, is linked to many things, including chronic diseases, including type 2 diabetes, cardiovascular disease, high blood pressure, and even cancer. It causes about one in five deaths in the United States each year, which is just barely underneath the death rate for smoking. So about 20% of people die from smoking-related illnesses. I think it's like 18.5% die from obesity-related diseases. So the magnitude is not to be underestimated. And this is based on a study published by the American Journal of Public Health. In addition, you have around 70% of U.S. adults aged 20 or older that are characterized as either overweight or obese. Now, just to give you the kind of segmentation in general, a person with a body mass index, a BMI of 25 to 29.9 is considered overweight, while a person with a body mass index, BMI, over 30 is considered obese. So while I'm going to share with you some of the rankings around states and cities in the United States, please know that every state in the United States has more than 20% of adults with obesity. So there's no state that is a, quote, good state. Some states are better than others, but no state has less than 20% of adults, according to the CDC, of adults with obesity. And this is a significant uptick since 1985, when no state, so there were zero states in 1985 that had an obesity rate higher than 15%. 1985, that's not that long ago. And certain states have had higher rates than others. In general, there are more obese people living in the South and the Midwest than in other parts of the country, but we'll get into more detail in a bit. Also, to give you an impact of the financial cost of obesity, it is not unexpectedly incredibly high as well. According to the Center for U.S. Disease Control and Prevention, the estimated annual medical cost of obesity in the United States alone is somewhere around $150 to $200 billion a year. So it was about 150, just under 150 in 2008. That's continued to skyrocket to much closer to 200 billion in 2018. And again, just for context and put it in perspective, in 2018, the entire U.S. weight loss, diet industry, weight control market was valued at 72 billion. But the U.S. spends about 200 billion in annual healthcare costs related just to obesity. Now, if you thought that was bad, this next part might even be a little more alarming. The national childhood obesity rate is just under 20% at about 18.5%. That obesity rate is the highest among the 20 most populous countries in the world. In the world. The rate varies among different age groups, but rises as children get a little bit older. So again, you have almost 14% of two to five-year-olds are characterized as obese. 14%, two to five-year-olds. That goes up to 18.4% of six to 11-year-olds, 
20.6% of 12 to 19 year olds are characterized as obese. Just staggering. New findings by the Physical Activity Council suggest a need for more aggressive efforts to combat this issue. Hmm, what a surprise. According to the report, about 82 million Americans aged six or older were completely inactive in 2018. Lack of physical activity is a leading cause of obesity in addition to some genetics, emotional instability, and overall sleeplessness. And it's amazing to me as technology has evolved, as people spend more time in front of screens and social media and video gaming, it's just such a stark contrast to, and I know this, I'm going to sound old, when I was a kid, our, I remember my parents just sending me outside saying, go play. There was no, like, you should have make stuff up which spurred creativity and you'd be in somebody's front yard or backyard. You'd have a ball and you'd start doing something and moving and throwing the ball at one another and tackling and playing football. There was no just sitting around. It was just going outside and moving 82 million Americans. I'm going to say this again, 82 million Americans age six and older were completely inactive in 2018. It's just mind numbing. It really, really is. So to further summarize some of the statistics, in a recent report by WalletHub, which is ironically a financial-based website, they decided to take a look at a slice of data at the state level to determine where obesity and overweight most dangerously persist. They looked at all 50 states, including the District of Columbia, across 29 key metrics. And these 29 key metrics were generally spread and rated across three different key dimensions. I won't go into the detail. You can go to the link to the website in the show notes. But the first one is obesity and overweight prevalence, which was a 60% weighting for that entire category. The second category, health consequences, 25% weighting. And the third category is food and fitness, which is about 15%. This then yielded a single weighted numerical score for ranking purposes. So without going into the entire detail of all of the rankings, I will kind of go through the top and bottom five. So starting with the fifth fattest state, Alabama, the fourth fattest state, Tennessee, number three, Kentucky, number two, West Virginia, and number one, Mississippi. Flipping it around to the least fattest state, so the fifth least fattest state, California, Then Connecticut, the third least fattest state, Massachusetts, second least fattest state, Colorado, and the number one least fattest state, Utah. A little surprising to me, but again, remember, every state has at least 20% obesity, so this is kind of the best of the worst. So I'll embed a state infographic into the website at www.fitterist.com. This is episode 35 of The Fitterist Show, so you can kind of click on each state and see what their score was. The data at the city level is similar. So I will again go through the five fattest cities. Number five, Mobile, Alabama. Number four, Jackson, Mississippi. Number three, Memphis, Tennessee. Number two, Shreveport, Louisiana. And number one, uh, it's kind of McAllen, Edinburgh, Mission, Texas. So similar trend in the rankings. In the city rankings, they had a little less access to certain data, so they used 19 key indicators in their methodology for the city ranking data. So the top five least fattest cities, number five, Denver, Colorado, number four, Minneapolis, number three, Portland, number two, Seattle, and number one, San Francisco, the least fattest cities. And again, I'll also embed a city infographic into the blog, the show notes on the webpage. So you can click on different cities around the country and see where your city lies in the rankings. So what causes obesity? Now, this is certainly not meant to be a thorough medical examination of this topic. I'm not a doctor, but obesity generally occurs at its most basic level. When a person takes in more calories than he or she expends through normal daily activities and exercise, it's not simply a matter of overindulgence or lack of control, 
right? You've got certain scientific and societal factors. There's genetics, the increased consumption of processed foods, sugar-sweetened beverages that are easily consumed in large quantities. Medical, certain medical conditions can also increase a person's risk of becoming obese. Things like even age can also trigger weight gain. Again, not surprisingly, diet has a very important connection to obesity. The fats in our food supply may well be playing a part in our inability to regulate food intake. When you look at the consumption of sugary soft drinks, which has just skyrocketed between 1950s to today, that Americans had actually tripled the amount of sweet beverages they drank each year. That's just one slice of one category. You've got artificial sweeteners, which again, if you listen to the show, the last podcast we talked about artificial sweeteners and it's signal to the brain and kind of trying to trick the brain and not delivering the sugar payload, which makes the brain crave sugar even more. There's got to be some correlation between the prevalence of processed fast foods, sugary beverages that exploded onto the scene and that earlier data point where no state in the United States had an obesity rate greater than 15% in 1985. That wasn't that long ago, but now no state is under 20%. That's an incredible swing. So there's got to be some causality between the availability and overconsumption of processed, artificially sweetened, and sugary beverages related to obesity. Now, I'm a pretty analytical guy. And when I look at the data from 1985 to 2018, you see the trend lines. And, you know, maybe I'm a little closer because I'm kind of in the fitness realm but I'm surprised there's not more of a full-scale, all-out war on obesity. It is, when you, when you compare it to something like smoking, where they have taken the steps of banning billboards that promote smoking, banning television commercials that promote smoking or show smoking, and obesity is literally nipping at the heels of smoking as the number one cause of deaths in the country, it's a little surprising that there's not more public attention. Now, there could be a lot of reasons. We're not going to go into them on this particular show. Big food, big sugar, big business. But when you look at the marketing to kids and children of essentially unhealthy junk food on a nonstop, regular basis across all media outlets, it's just surprising there's not more public outcry and even government involvement. I mean, look, if you're in government and you have kids, I would think you'd be a little concerned with the marketing of the nonstop barrage of marketing processed sugary drinks, processed foods to your kids. And how do you start to curb that? How do you start to regulate some of that? Anyway, topic for another show. Let's turn our attention on a related note, though, to some of the known health issues involving obesity. And it's, it's a long list. Let me just go through it. I'm just going to read through these very quickly, but just give you an idea of the scope of health issues. Type 2 diabetes, high blood pressure, heart disease, stroke, gallbladder disease, cancer, including breast cancer, liver, pancreatic cancer, colorectal cancer, prostate, kidney, all those cancers related to obesity. High cholesterol, osteoarthritis, sleep apnea, respiratory issues and problems, gastroesophageal reflux disease, urinary stress incontinence, infertility, depression, sexual dysfunction, physical disability, lower work achievement, and not to be excluded, social isolation. That is a freaking massive list of health issues. It's not exhaustive, but it's massive. When you look at those categories of health issues, it is stunning to see the impact of obesity in all those different areas. So we've talked about the magnitude of obesity, and we've also discussed a little bit about the financial, the $200 billion annual impact of obesity. And we've also just briefly mentioned the non-trivial health issues that can arise or be exacerbated by obesity. 
So now let's turn our attention a little bit and talk about how we might be able to treat or prevent obesity. So I'm going to break this up into two different topics, the treatment being one and the prevention being the other. So treatment of obesity primarily involves ultimately changing a person's behavior. Now there could be other technology and things like surgery to reduce the size of a patient's stomach, to alter the digestive tract. There can be medications for those who have trouble losing weight on their own, but primarily it's a behavioral change. So the National Institute of Diabetes and Digestive and Kidney Disease also says that common treatments, again, not surprisingly, include eating more healthy foods, incorporating more physical activity, changing habits, huge one, simple things, taking the stairs instead of the elevator, prepping food at home instead of going out to eat, developing that healthy eating plan with little, almost always have fewer calories if you prep at home, setting very realistic, measurable goals. A lot of things we've talked about in earlier episodes of The Fitter Show, participating in, if you need to, formal weight management programs. If that's what works for you, go for it. Seeking help from family, get a support system in place from family and friends, health professionals, support groups that can make it easier to develop habits, that gives you an accountability group to make sure that you stay on track are all great ideas as part of a treatment plan to weight control. And while everyone should know it's not an overnight thing, again, celebrate small wins, small successes, obese patients who even lose 5% of their body weight, right? Can reduce their risk of obesity related health problems like type two diabetes, as well as lowering their blood pressure and cholesterol levels. So It's not going to happen overnight. It's going to be a stepwise process with measurable goals along the way. But these are some steps one can take to start to treat both overweight and obesity. On the prevention side of things, there are a couple common principles that generally stand out with regard to obesity prevention across local, state, and federal guidelines. Again, most of these are common sense You've heard me repeat them time and time again in this show and in other shows. Number one, increase physical activity. Number two, improve nutrition through increased consumption of fruits, vegetables, healthy foods, and nuts. Three, encourage mobility between work and school and communities, family and support structure. And to prevent childhood obesity in particular, there are some school and early childhood policies. There's one called Head Start, which is a early childhood education program, which is a school-based physical education that promotes walking and biking to and from school, increasing healthy eating and physical activity at school, to and from school, and with a support system in place while reducing the risk of obesity. Now, Some states have actually implemented laws, largely tacking those on to early childhood education programs to improve access to healthy food, increase physical activity in order to promote a healthy weight. You see this often in the examination of what is being served as part of school lunches and how do you provide healthy lunches combined with gym class and the promotion of physical activity throughout the day. Another avenue that some people discuss is having the food industry take a larger role in solving the obesity crisis. Now, this is a little bit of a tricky one because the food industry is there to get you to buy more food, consume more food on a regular and repeated basis to drive profits for the company. But making Highly processed and fast food, more expensive. Things you probably see or hear in the news like the soda tax could could curb consumption and help to lower the obesity rate in the U.S. over time. Now, things like the soda tax are an interesting concept, and they may indeed have an impact, but it's also a bit of a slippery slope where food and drinks are potentially taxed relative to their potential impact or potential abuse leading to or 
negative consequences. It's just a slippery slope on where you draw the line. Should buffets be taxed because one could potentially overeat? But that could happen with any food at the grocery store as well. Hence the slippery slope analogy. In my opinion, education at a very early age is a huge key here. Understanding the very basics of nutrition, diet, sleep is probably one of the most and best steps toward widespread awareness of food choices and consumption. Again, a soda tax may be a component to increase awareness, right? You see a sticker shock because that soda that was $1.29 is now $1.99. Now, the question is, will that result in and of itself in a behavioral change? Hmm. For some people that might, they might say, hey, I'm going to go for a lower cost option. Maybe I'll buy the bottle of water for $1.29 instead of the Coke for $1.99. But more likely, it needs to be coupled with education that makes that individual want to change. In this example, their soda consumption. Just as another data point on this specific topic, remember that cities, including Philadelphia, Boulder, Colorado, and Berkeley, California, have implemented and levy attacks on sugar-sweetened beverages. Now, the results of those say that since 2016, that the tax has led to a 21% drop in the consumption of sugary drinks in the Berkeley area alone. Not that Berkeley was ever the hotbed of obesity, but it's a data point. A related data point, though, is Philadelphia, the price of sugary beverages sold in supermarkets and merchandisers, pharmacies, CVSs, corner stores, all of those sales fell after the city implemented a tax on those sugary products, the soda tax. But what happened? The sales in the towns surrounding and bordering Philadelphia increased dramatically. Look, people find a way around stuff. If they want to get a Coke, someone's going to drive 20 extra minutes and buy a case or two for them and their friends to consume. People just find a way around stuff. They just do. So in summary, look, most people know that being overweight or obese is unhealthy. And if you eat too much, that also contributes to being overweight. It's the basics, the simple calories in, calories out. But just telling people that there's a problem also doesn't really solve it. Now, the public health experts they said that they were basically alarmed by the continuing rise in obesity among adults because most people understand that if you eat a lot of food and don't exercise, you're going to get fat. But those efforts to educate people about the true health risks and the costs of a poor diet, poor nutrition, lack of exercise don't really seem to be working. Again, obesity, when you look at the numbers, is comparable to cigarette smoking as a public health hazard and leading cause of death. 20% of Americans die from each of those. 20% from smoking, 20% from obesity. And it is probably the leading preventable cause of death in the United States. We got to do something. While the latest survey data doesn't explain exactly why Americans continue to get heavier, continue to eat more, experts do cite three major areas as kind of factors. One is lifestyle. Do you move? Simple move. Do you get up at lunch and go for a walk? Do you walk in the morning? Do you walk after dinner regularly? Do you take your dogs, pets, whatever for a walk? Take yourself for a walk. Take your spouse, significant other for a walk. Just get out and move. Are you regularly active? Do you do cardiovascular? And it doesn't, we're not talking about running a double marathon or ultra marathon. We're talking about walking around the block for 10 minutes, 20 minutes, work up to a half hour, do some resistance strength training with some bands or some, you can do it in your backyard. We're not talking about competing at the highest level of physical perfection <laughs> in reducing some of these core numbers. Second area that experts have cited is genetics. Is there a genetic predisposition in your family toward heavier weight, heavier BMI? And the third area, and probably one of the most important ones, and certainly the most controllable one, is diet. What do you eat on a regular basis? Just a data point, fast food sales in the United States rose 23% from 2012 to 2017. That's a lot. And treating or preventing obesity likely is going to require a multi-pronged approach. Certainly, you have to do early education about food, about nutrition, the impact of one's health on food choices and regular food consumption. 
learn the basics of calories in versus calories out. Second thing, regular activity levels. If 82% of Americans are completely sedentary, there's a lot of room of upside to improve significantly. In the third area that is likely to help treat and or prevent obesity is policy decisions. Because it's so out of control, there might need to be legal policies that could span things like better more clear food labels, which there's been some strides in that. And it's actually not really had an impact in my opinion. Second thing could be taxing potentially harmful foods or drinks. This is again, along the lines of the soda tax slippery slope, but could serve as a wake up call for some folks when they just get that sticker shock and say, wow, why is this so expensive? Well, not only is it expensive, it also is not good for you. So maybe look for a different option. The third area of the policy decision that could happen is limiting advertising and marketing of these unhealthy foods, particularly to children's and teens that are very impressionable and learn that sugar marshmallows are magically delicious at about age two and a half. I might be underestimating that as well. And finally, another area of a policy decision that could be explored are health and or insurance benefits or savings or something along those lines for an individual to drive positive lifestyle changes. Now, these would be things that would be measurable, lowering one's BMI, low, consistently lowering blood pressure over time, et cetera, et cetera, there, where they get either an insurance break or savings because they're, in theory, helping to save that $200 billion annual medical bill that is due to obesity today. So lots of opportunities to have an impact here. But as a nation, we've got to move pretty quickly because the numbers... Don't lie. With that, I'd like to thank you for taking the time to listen to The Fitterist Show. You can follow us on Instagram at Fitterist Mind Body and on Twitter at Fitterist Mind. If you enjoyed this episode, please send it to a friend or subscribe to make sure you don't miss any future episodes of The Fitterist Show. My name is Chris Frown, and make it a magical day.